Hello, my name is Artificial intelligence has been an emerging field of study that has the potential to revolutionize many aspects of healthcare, including anesthesia. Now, anesthesia is a critical aspect of patient care that ensures they are pain-free during surgery. And the administration of anesthesia requires a high degree of precision and monitoring to ensure patient safety. One condition that can complicate the administration of anesthesia is malignant hyperthermia, MH a rare but life-threatening condition that can occur during surgery. To prevent MH, research has been conducted using various methods, including meta-analysis, randomized clinical trials, RCTs, and reviews. Unfortunately, due to the nature of MH's purely emergent nature, there is a dearth of meta-analysis and RCT data obtained. Additionally, certified registered nurse anesthetists play a critical role in the administration of anesthesia and are involved in research and clinical practice. This presentation aims to provide an alternative to pass, bypass the difficulty of creating an RCT or meta-analysis by justifying why it is unethical to conduct such trials, and yet also how AI can be used to circumvent the danger while maintaining research ethics, all while introducing advent technology to the field, technology that can help us predict malignant hyperthermia. So the current treatment is why is malignant hyperthermia so hard to study? That's the question. Currently, the only way to predict malignant hyperthermia is to do a pre-op scan um, concerning with just basically surveys. Now, I've discussed this with Dr. McKinnon and Dr. Kramer. Both attest to having maybe treated a patient that developed MH sometime in their careers. Um, not very often, but it does happen. Um, Preoperative uh, assessment scan requires asking the patients questions about their anesthesia, medication, and family history. Of course, this poses a problem. If the patient is anesthesia naive and never received any volatile anesthetic medications or succinylcholine before, or if the patient is adopted and have no knowledge of their biological family history, it could pose a problem. Currently, the only way to predict malignant hyperthermia is to do a pre-op screen. The efficacy can vary because it is rife with subjectivity and also relies highly on experience. Experience cannot be relied on because MH is so rare. So, prevention and fast recognition are the key to saving the patient's life. AI technology can create a statistical prediction of MH without the use of invasive therapy or long lab testing, all while reducing racial bias, hospital costs, and without delaying surgery. Now, the mechanism of action, let's briefly touch on this mechanism of malignant hypothermia. I forgot to mention here, it is a genetic mutation plus a triggering agent, which creates an uncontrolled release of calcium into the muscles. So let's dive deeper into that. Now, malignant hypothermia is a rare but potentially life-threatening condition that can occur as a result of exposure to certain drugs used during anesthesia. The condition is caused by a mutation in the rhyanodine receptor, RYR1, as well as other receptors that um, we won't talk about here. Now, they are located in the sarcoplasmic reticulum of skeletal muscle cells. When a triggering agent such as succinylcholine or halothane is administered, it causes an uncontrolled release of calcium ions from the sarcoplasmic reticulum through the mutated RYR1 channels, as shown here. This leads to an excessive buildup of calcium ions in the muscle cells, which triggers a sustained contraction of the muscles, causing rigidity and hyperthermia. At the neuromuscular junction, the triggering agent can also affect the activity of the acetylcholine receptor on the muscle cells. In some cases, the triggering agent can cause the ACHR, which is the acetylcholine receptor, to stay open longer than normal, leading to an excessive influx of calcium ions again into the muscle cells, further exacerbating the condition. Now overall, the mechanism of malignant hypothermia involves dysregulation of calcium ion channels right here, both at the level of the SR and at the NNJ, but that is the gist of the mechanism of action. Next, now creating a meta-analysis for MH I found to be quite difficult. I did look through PubMed and check through their online databases, Medline, as well as Google Scholar, and talk to some of the librarians. But overall, there's not a lot of meta-analysis studies. Um, there's not a lot of studies, period, in malignant hyperthermia. It's just so rare. 
Um, there's a couple of uh, references that I've mentioned here at the end of this presentation that shows that uh, the incidence of MH is probably either 1 to 30,000 or 1 to 500,000 people. It kind of varies quite wildly. And I don't blame anybody because there seems to be a dearth of research and there's really not a very particular good binomial distribution to definitely say with a 95% confidence interval that this is how often malignant hyperthermia happens. But it does happen. So it's something that we should be aware of as future anesthetists, nurse anesthetists, and nurse anesthesiologists. As you can see here in the PubMed search, a total of only nine, let's zoom in a little bit closer, results show between 2013 to 2023 that there is a less than both my hands, there's only nine results that are meta-analysis qualified. Um, for malignant hyperthermia, because you just can't really recruit um, in, you know, actual in vivo patients to try to figure out whether or not it's gonna happen to them because it's basically an allergic reaction. But they do here at this, um, this specific paper, the incidence of malignant hyperthermia in patients undergoing general anesthesia, Dr. Zhang Yong does recommend a particular protocol that I would like to follow should I be able to do a meta-analysis for a blended hyperthermia at all, whether or not I want to pursue that as my capstone project. And this is a evidence-based research presentation, so I would like to go over that here. Um, so for example, let's start with the meta-analysis protocol. These are the steps. We will search midline EM base as well as Google search. We'll use a meta-analysis of observational studies in epidemiology, MOOSE, and prefer preferred reporting items for systematic review and meta-analysis PRISMA guidelines. Now, the inclusion and exclusion criteria and data extraction plan are not quite needed, and neither is IRB approval because we won't be using live research subjects here. Um, but then again, we also still have to adjust for bias. So this, uh, these authors recommend using the Newcastle Ottawa scale and the study quality of the modified risk of study bias tool. Um, subsequently, they'll, sun they'll synthesize data using confidence interval of 95% by checking heterogeneity of studies via Q and I-squared statistics with p-value of less than 0.1 for chi-squared statistics of I-squared greater than 50% to show considerable heterogeneity. Then mantle hansel random effect model for analysis. Then finally, evidence grade using grade, which is the grading of recommendations, assessment development, and evaluation. That is a lot, but um, it's better than what I can come up with by myself. <laughs> um, so we do need to embrace new tools like AI. Continuing on, um, I'm at the, at the cusp of research here. There's this particular research that we really can't do uh, much live in vivo studies for uh, without having an actual event happen but since we're not quite sure the statistics of when it will happen and when we will be able to predict it we cannot do the research and if we don't do the research then we won't be able to predict exactly how um, and when malignant hyperthermia will happen happen so I think that the new course would be to use this new technology which is AI to be able to create a new kind of research where we could actually um, use machine learning and data storage and um, uh, algorithms to be able to predict uh, within a 95% confidence interval exactly when predictive hyperthermia and malignant hyperthermia will happen in a particular patient. So we do need to embrace the new tools like AI. It is a technology which is a tool, it is not interventional equipment, therefore receiving IRB approval and recruiting clinical research subjects should expectedly be easier. So what is AI? It is an artificial intelligence that uh, uses, uh, uses statistics, data mining, and machine learning to predict and possibly stop risky, pre risky procedures that could be potentially failed. Using ChatGPT software to take millions of data and evaluate it in MS, as well as uh, using it as a, a collaborative tool, keyword here being tool, that gets better with each use, helps to decrease personal bias. I think one of the things that also helps that is similar to this would be kind of like using a pupilometer. Um, like a Google-backed pupilometer where they're able to use this during rural areas where they can find out exactly how to predict whether or not a person is having an, a uh, glaucoma or retinal damage from diabetes. All right, so now how will AI work? The potential is limitless, but here are some main techniques. Data collection. 
AI algorithm can be trained to collect and analyze various patient data, such as vitals, and the administration of anesthesia. This data can be continuously monitored and used to detect any changes that may be indicative of MH. There's also pattern recognition. AI can be trained to recognize patterns in patient data that are associated with MH. For example, it could analyze the relationship between elevated and end tidal carbon dioxide levels in tachycardia, which are both commonly seen in MH. And I think when it gets better, then we can start using the symptoms of the masseter um, uh, spasming as one of the, the factors in uh, recognizing early MH when it is happening, um, which I believe is more indicative of succinylcholine use. Now, how will AI work? Oh, I'm sorry. So keep going is the uh, risk stratification. AI could be used to stratify patients into high and low risk categories for developing MH based on various risk factors. Uh, we could use personal or family history of MH or specific genetic mutations like the renanidine receptor that are associated with the condition. We could use those particular variables as a fixed, uh, as a dependent variables. Um, and then we could just kind of hone in on that to be able to justify our meta-analysis study or the study using AI. Subsequently, I hope to use this as a decision support system um, using AI algorithm to provide good support and justification for anesthesiologists and nurse anesthetists by alerting them to the potential presence of MH and suggesting appropriate actions to take, such as discontinuing triggering agents and administering dantrolene, which I found that doesn't take as long as it did when I was an ICU nurse because now there's a new FDA approved drug. Um, so medicine and AI collaboration, if CRNA is adaptive technology, it can be used to predict other predispositions, not just genetics. So that's really what I'm going for, trying to see if this technology can be applied to other things such as cancer, any other um, diagnoses that people are predisposed to. So evidence is that there's different types of evidence, anecdotal, some younger patients, especially those with no available medical history, have increased risk. We don't know who's going to be susceptible to MH if they don't know, uh, or we have greater risk of not knowing if the patient doesn't have a clear medical history. Um, the meta-analysis is something that we use using search words for Medline Embase and Google Scholar. It will help us obtain, but we need more. And finally, for review, the knowledge regarding general uh, genetic abnormalities, signs and symptoms. Uh, therefore, we need new ways of obtaining this relevant clinical data, and I believe AI can help us do that. So the hidden implication is that RCT and systematic reviews are nearly non-existent due to the nature and frequency of the affliction. Therefore, AI is the next best solution. Pending success, it can also usher in predictability and preparation for a slew of other diseases. It can also mine data for otherwise unethical research, such as RCT, for novel drugs in cancer pediatric patients. So I'm hoping that focusing on something as um, elusive and rare can also transform to other um, disease processes where we can predict and also help create a better patient outcome using the current technology. Um, so that'll be it. Thank you so much. I've hit it under less than 15 minutes. So thank you for watching, especially you, Dr. Rodriguez. <laughs> I appreciate your time and interest. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to give me contact. All right. Um, these are the references that I've compiled. Uh, once again, thank you so much for listening to this presentation. Bye.